Welcome everybody, this is Yarl Jonas from Core Sites, and today we're going to be talking about designing effective resources for online learning with Ruth Rominger from the National Repository of Online Courses. Ruth is a designer of learning experiences and currently is tinkering with the design of reusable open learning objects, distributed learning networks, and visual facilitation techniques. Ruth's work history includes both corporate and nonprofit management positions, where she's been able to uh, and, and become quite known for her graphic facilitation techniques that generate creativity, share vision, and actionable solutions. So we're very happy to have her with us today to share her, some of her methodologies of how to design effective resources for online learning. Ruth, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And again, just remind everybody that this session is being recorded. We will distribute a link to the recording as well as post this to our Core Sites YouTube channel. Uh, and the sessions are also, uh, the PDF of today's PowerPoint is also available. And maybe, uh, Sarah, if you can help me out to put that link in the chat, that would be great. So people can see that link and perhaps um, download that to go along with the session in the case that you have any difficulty with viewing the slides as we go through today. We also have, uh, before we begin, Danny Pedrotti, who's uh, in charge of the membership services for NROC in case anybody has any questions along that regard as we go through today. So Danny, Ruth, thank you so much for being with us and I'll turn it over to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Jarl, and thank you all for um, inviting us to share what, our, what, what we've been doing for designing online learning resources. I'm really glad to be able to talk to people who are interested in this as all of you uh, who have come to this I'm sure are aware that it's a very dynamic field of online learning and designing resources. We have new tools and new possibilities. More and more people are using online resources inside of the classroom for blended and flipped and online learning. So we have a lot of learning to continue to do together and to share constantly. And those are some of the things I'm going to be touching on here with the the framework, really, that we developed from the beginning of NROC um, that has allowed us to continually learn and improve the material that we've been working on. And we've been very happy to, to be able to stay with our basic principles and guidelines over the years of our project. And they've served us well to be able to add with the new technology and the new delivery opportunities so that uh, we are staying at pace with the changing learning landscape. So I want to give you a little context uh, of our project before we get into the to more of the details of our development process. Um, the the NROC project is a project of the Monterey Institute for Technology and Education. And we're a nonprofit organization that was founded in about 2004. Many of us had worked together in different um, venues, uh, but all having to do with educational publishing and media development and technology. We've come together on this project to really serve a broad mission of increasing the access to quality educational resources for teachers and students worldwide and at little and no cost. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're balancing all of that um, as I go through and give you some context of the organization. Over the years, from about 2005 till today, to today we have had um, the growth of our project with some different um, offerings, I would say. Let me get my cursor going here. I'll take the hand. We started out um, being funded by the Hewlett Foundation to look around the country at the development of online resources because there was a lot of public funds and a lot of faculty in uh, colleges pre predominantly were starting to develop online materials and there was a thought that we could 
gather up some of these materials and through an evaluation process and some resources, we could gather them, improve them, and make them available to distribute uh, for wider use. And so we developed a set of guidelines that were for evaluating um, online course materials. And that project, which we uh, is known as OSEP, has turned out um, some some uh, guidelines that are still available. We don't uh, con we don't currently re continue to review programs, but we do have the guidelines available on our website. And I know my colleague Danny is pointing to some areas on the website where people can access them. So through that project, we were able to develop a course repository. We uh, identified some rich media content that had been built in a particular learning management system, and we repurposed it and got other donations that we were able to modify using our guidelines to build the original repository of NROC. As we did that, we were really reaching out to the community of developers and faculty and teachers who were in this area trying to develop and share resources. And it occurred to us that this was never going to really change the way education was happening until we were really in a collaborative relationship with each other. Um, and so our project led to what is the NROC network, which is a membership network. And I'll tell you more about that. Um, the membership network gave us a platform to be able to support additional projects. Um, and Yarl mentioned Hippocampus. This is a project that we were able to build as an open resource for anyone who uh, was looking for rich educational material online. And it's available online. And we continue to add some really great features to that so that teachers can um, use it with their students and students and parents can access it and find material. And to support all of this work, we uh, soon realized that teachers and instructors, faculty, really didn't have enough access to professional development opportunities. And so we started also a project around open PD. And with uh, this, this framing, you can see that we had an evolution of projects. And they were all guided by what we originally developed as uh, some principles for guiding the quality of our projects. I use the term principles because it's really important to think um, in a broader context than a particular course, a particular subject, a particular learning management system or technology. As you can see from the list of the categories of the OSEP evaluation criteria, there is what we look at as a system approach to looking at everything that's involved in developing a course. And in this case, the OSEP criteria also addressed some of the um, implementation of that. From, for our purposes in developing content, we developed a set of 10 criteria that we felt at a principal level were, were critical for being able to develop things that had longevity. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the aspects of this as we go forward. We don't want to just focus on these two or three things up here because the tools are readily available and we know how to teach certain things. And I'm using the we in, in the broadest sense of all of us in this field. There is a, a, is a need to investigate all of these attributes 
before we go forward and actually uh, develop material. So the online repository, the national repository, is really focused on high quality multimedia resources. Our um, emphasis is in the secondary, um, some college prep, advanced placement, and higher education. I have the GE curriculum, and here are a few of the different screen grabs over uh, of some of the things that have been in the repository over time. NROC is unique uh, as an open education resource. We focus on all of these criteria and in particular, we are unique in that we're a nonprofit project supported by institutional members as well as private foundations. And with our institutional membership, we have been able to, <coughs> to have a sustainable model through having a membership network. Excuse me one second. With the sustainability model, we've been able to continue to support the constant improvement of the project, as you saw in our timeline. And we were, we've been able to maintain a quality, curricular, media-rich, and flexible framework for our content um, based on having these sets of principles that have guided us even through all of the changes in the education landscape and uh, technology. The network is, has now grown to around 140 plus um, educational institutions, and those include state departments of education, different educational agencies at different levels within the states, uh, school systems, college systems, and districts. So they um, join the network as institutions, and it provides teachers and students with access to all of the content and this network in which people can um, collaborate. And in particular, we're focusing on both support of uh, all of the members as well as open professional development. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those things as we go forward. The professional development has been key uh, to helping teachers learn how to use digital media as well as learn about the NROC project and keep up with trends that are going on in the, chain, the constant changing of technology. And we've learned uh, through our experience that really teachers benefit most from, as well as uh, designers, curriculum designers, and instructional designers, from networking with their peers. And uh, when we started this, it was kind of a new idea. Um, now all of you are uh, all of us are really aware that networking is a a very effective and um, really, as as Howard Rheingold says, it's the language of our times. We realize that these things are complex and resources are short, and being in a network is a valuable way of being able to work together and leverage our resources. So leveraging our resources, we have been able to put up this site, Hippocampus. If you haven't been there, you, it's a really good first introduction to the rich resources that are available um, through our project. You can search for things by topic, course, textbook. You can sign up uh, for a login and be able to have additional resources. And we continue to add content and links. Uh, and we'll continue to grow out uh, the features. You can create your own playlist of content that's within Hippocampus. And all of these features, as you'll see when we get back to our uh, development guidelines, they have been um, possible because 
we started with a set of principles that have guided our our development and have allowed us to repurpose um, content and deliver it in in different ways. This hippocampus site is going to be available on mobile devices uh, later in the summer as well. Our most recent project where we've been able to do some really um, state of the art type of uh, development is has been supported by the Gates and Hewlett Foundation and we were able to start from scratch to develop Algebra 1 and a developmental math program. This site, nrockmath.org, will lead you to more details. As you can tell in this presentation, there's a lot to see and so um, I'm pointing you to some resources that you can follow up with to learn more um, so that I can cover a lot of uh, territory here on this webinar. So this project has been really uh, fun for us. We have teachers and students currently piloting these projects and giving us feedback so that we can improve how they're used and share the information amongst uh, all of the people using the material. We do that through our another one of our recent projects uh, that we call Connected PD. And we're really trying to uh, work with others to offer open PD opportunities about the future of learning and teaching through a networked approach. So we're bringing information from the open education resources field, online education, the research that's going on in digital media and learning, and 21st century learning design. And utilizing the different new social media tools, participatory media tools, to help instructors learn and experience firsthand how to do um, you know, current methods in teaching. And so this project, um, again, is a way that we're reaching out and being able to involve more people and get feedback regularly. So I want to stop for a second before I continue on just to uh, make sure that we're all together here and no one has um, any burning questions before I um, go a little further. Is there anything that's come up in our uh, chat uh, or something that is on people's mind right now? I see that uh, we are getting these postings. Thanks, Claudia. Claudia works with us in the Connected PD project, and she's um, put in the in the chat area how you can access the Connected PD blog and the Twitter feed. So we have these types of social media um, opportunities or channels, as we call them, to allow both our members of our network to communicate with each other as well as connect with a broader audience through the Connected PD. All right. <laughs> Glenn, I'll let someone else address that for you, your question. And I will turn back unless there's anything else someone wants to ask. Um, okay. Um, Vicki, I will talk a little bit more about the um, the work that we're uh, we're planning right now, we would love to be getting into language development, language acquisition, um, and uh, learning languages, world languages, and that is on really the top of our list that we're talking to um, others about being able to do. So stay tuned. It will be um, coming your way soon, I hope. So why uh, an education uh, or a network of educators? Um, it may seem obvious, but 
it's really important uh, in terms of development of content that there is more and more often a shared set of guidelines and principles. This allows us all to leverage our resources so that we can coordinate and collaborate on projects. And the material that we do produce, we're able to then mix and match, repurpose and adapt because we know that it will be um, possible to use it in different systems and to add it to um, existing courses that I that someone may have developed by coming uh, at it from a principal level. And then because of that, we're, it's possible to keep them maintained and sustain the projects and the um, use of those materials instead of having uh, like so much has happened in the past, people develop some content in one uh, system and they develop it as kind of a monolithic uh, course and then it makes it hard to maintain for others to use it or usually for that person that has first developed it to be able to um, adequately maintain it. And so if you're developing something and part of a learning community, you're able to usually leverage your experience with a lot of other people, leverage your resources, and be able to do a lot more with uh, what you're intending to do in your own development. All right, so I am now going to um, dive into our principles. And I'm not going to go through each of the 10 domains. Um, we, we have those a document about that and sort of the application of those principles and rubrics for the guiding uh, development. And those are available on the website. I'm going to give you the broad strokes here. And the key for me is that what we've done is take a systems approach to the design of the resources. And why that is important is that there is no one methodology or one domain that really achieves quality education and teaching. We started by doing a lot of research into what we know about learning, about using technology, about just good learning theory and assessment theory and came up with our guidelines based on drawing from all of these different domains. And the days in which we argue that a uh, constructivist approach is the answer or assessment and standards is the answer or having expert teachers is the answer or making it student-led, student-centered is the answer, I hope is, beh uh, uh, is behind us because we know from experience, I think everybody who's a teacher, that it really takes a combination of these things and it needs to be adapted to the environment. And we need to have teachers have all of this at their disposal so that they can do the best job at designing um, content as well as uh, sharing it. So when I talk about uh, the systems approach, we really looked at integrating best practices throughout these. And if you look at these uh, bullet points, You'll notice we did this research back in the early you know, 2000s, and these all stand the, the test of time in terms of what really we understand to be very important. Um, some of the work that is getting a lot of attention now is really about the community-centered, the idea of of students needing social context and cultural context, connecting to real world, having it rele relevant and interactive, um, assessment multiple types at different levels, 
Um, so without going into the details of each of these, I invite you to look at the, this more uh, thoroughly um, by following the post. The main concept here is that it's integrated and we're looking at the whole system of learning and teaching. So this is to make the point that before you dive into developing um, any kind of content, you really need to think about choosing a set of principles and guidelines that you can use with others, um, whether it's at an institutional level or if you have a group, uh, an association or learning community, some peers that you want to work with. Having a set of guidelines is really helpful for being able to have whatever you do have legs into the future and into different environments. I've talked about the NROC guidelines and our OSEP guidelines. Some of you may be familiar with the guidelines that have come out of INACOL in collaboration with SREB, and those are very commonly used. There's a lot of information about those on the iCall and SREB site, as well as Quality Matters. Um, Quality Matters has a whole process that um, institutions go through. And both of these have different um, aspects to them that include some of the support and institutional issues besides uh, course development. Our guidelines are really about the content development um, and that's what I'll uh, show you some more of here. The guiding principles really allow a group of people to create synergy and share the methods and models. It's for us, sharing these guidelines helps to increase the number of experienced qualified developers. The more we can share our practices and experiences, the more we have developers that can help um, the rest of the community to improve the learning materials that are um, available. And obviously, in a time of reduced funds um, that are available throughout the education sector, it helps to be able to leverage our investments so that we're pooling funds to be able to uh, support projects like NROC and uh, institutions to be able to possibly develop some material together and share it instead of every campus and every teacher having to try and develop their own. An important thing that we really are encouraging everyone to consider um, as they start a development project is to consider the ownership and rights of use. For any of you who aren't familiar with the OER field, the Open Education Resources Movement, a lot of people call it, and Creative Commons, please check out these resources. The OER Commons is a portal in which you can learn a lot about open education resources and also search for example material that are open that you can reuse. They are about to launch a project that's a tool where you can um, correlate open education resources to Common Core uh, standards. Creative Commons is the licensing, it's a nonprofit licensing um, environment which, in which you can choose to attach a Creative Commons copyright to your material. And the, what Creative Commons does is it still retains your right as the creator. You retain the copyright. It's not throwing it out there saying it belongs to anybody. It's yours, but you can attach to it different rights of use so that you can allow, and there's different levels, you can allow your colleagues to download and repurpose or reuse your your resources as long as they give you um, attribution. You can also allow people to 
um, adapt it and sort of use it in different ways, um, but reuse in the way of adapting it with the idea that they then have to also put it under Creative Commons, and you can restrict the use of the commercial use. So you can do all of those things, and the Creative Commons site is actually a t has a tool where you just check boxes, put in information, and it gives you a live URL to attach to your documents that will refer anyone that is interested in using it and, and, and finds it to be able to see what rights that you've attached. It's a really important change. And and it's being broadly used all over the world. And what that does is help us build a body of good content that is shareable. So as you start to uh, work on any of your projects, investigate this. You can also find a lot of things that you might be able to incorporate into your work. Collaborative development process. So the collaborative development process that we're investigating here is our process, uh, as I mentioned, the systemic approach. We are looking at um, guidelines, how we involve the end user, the product design process, and how that involves the curriculum, professional development, and the technology. I have this as a circular item because it really does all feed into one another. It's not a linear process. Um, it has to be informing each step, informing the other. In the development process, starting with thinking about the curriculum, it's not a process in which you start with a tool. It's not a process where you think, um, I have this new uh, Camtasia software, and so I'm going to create a course. You want to start with the um, curriculum and think about defining the scope, the audience, the objectives, whether you're creating a new project or you're reusing um, something and modifying it uh, that you have already created. You want to think about where the content fits in the curriculum and be able to define uh, the grade, the level, um, and as specifically or generally as you're aiming um, at doing, and look at the curricular standards. It's really important when you're developing content to tie it to standards, uh, even if that's not the way that you particularly are going to uh, use the material. In order for it to have uh, longevity, and to be able to be mixed, whether your own mixing over time or someone else's in, that's um, on your campus or up here. Um, if you tie it to standards, it gives some metadata that allows it to be uh, to travel and have important relevant information, both the curricular fit and the standards, so that it can be used in many different settings. One of the challenges we've had, whether it's um, with uh, the type of, of project like Merlot or on a campus where a lot of faculty have developed uh, many resources over time, because there isn't a practice of defining the scope um, beyond just the classroom um, that somebody's developing it for, the, the course material usually doesn't have the ability to go beyond that one classroom. And uh, because of the nature of, of education, we really want to be able to generalize and share these resources and to be able to remix. So it's important to look at other people's syllabi, to look at other uh, effective resources, learning objects, and how users use the technology. Because it isn't just about the content, uh, seeing how content works in a technology. The editorial process has to be um, very rigorous. 
uh, if it is to have again some some use beyond the individual uh, developer or, or creator uh, using it with their own students today. It's if it's if it the editorial process is rigorous, it's possible for that material to be used over a decade uh, with. As the discipline changes, it's possible to be able to to understand what's covered and where it has holes. So you want to look at how you're defining the coverage and the types of activities and interactions before you take uh, any other steps. So what we do is we identify subject matter experts who have expertise in the particular subject, the relevant level of students, and preferably have some uh, experience in online instruction. Although that isn't always uh, necessary as long as somebody's in a learning um, fr frame of mind to understand how their teaching might change uh, and how they represent information um, having been in an online environment. The subject matter experts actually start by writing a draft outline and and defining all of the learning objectives. So before any other content is developed, you want to have a set of learning objectives that everything is going to be written towards. Um, the the learning objectives are then guiding all of the different types of content and assessment that are developed. We divide up the writing assignments um, with different subject matter experts so that there is a team that can inform each other and they can review and have a, a more uh, rich approach to the content that any one person might come up with on their own. And we have different templates that we have developed for writing lesson scripts, uh, assessments, uh, activities, different assignments such as uh, discussion questions or reading assignments, simulated exercises, etc., depending on the, the discipline. We develop all of this without uh, thought of exactly the technology of delivery, knowing that we want to have a variety of multimodal experiences. So um, we're looking at what we call it scripts because writing for uh, visual media is an art that really is writing to the screen as opposed to writing for a lecture or to for a um, maybe talking to still images. When you're writing for the screen, you're writing to emphasize the visuals that are on the page. So you're writing a narration, you're writing text for the screen, which is usually not very dense and minimal, and you're thinking about the stages of the development um, of the visuals. So you want the visuals to have um, basically storyboards. They're usually most effective if they're not static. And so all of this needs to be taken into consideration as you divide up the assignments. The design, our design philosophy is to try and keep the design of the navigation and the structure so transparent and simple in a sophisticated way that the learner doesn't need to think about how to figure out how to use the course. And that is probably a, a, an art that is um, more common as we have experience, but it's not a um, because you have the tool, you're able to uh, create a navigation structure. There is a real um, expertise to 
coming up with transparent, clear navigation. And you want that to be consistent. Um, so the simpler it is, the more you can create consistency across different content. Um, you can, you can um, then have different course materials that are developed, and you can mix and match them so that they can be used to create new courses in different contexts. You're always thinking about the presentation as a mix of presenting content and interacting with the content so that they're, um, the student and the teacher are experiencing different modes of acquiring the knowledge. Um, I'll show you. Um, well, I, we won't go into the live site, but you'll see that at, at work, and I'll point out some of that when we see some of the screen grabs. So in designing uh, the content presentation, you're doing a mix of text, audio, visualization, et cetera, since, uh, uh, for example, you know, mixing these different types of media. So when you're developing things, you're not developing each media piece, each screen um, as a separate piece. You're developing them to be working together to create what is a, a coherent learning object. And I'll show you what we mean by that in one moment. So after the, uh, you know, you've, you're getting into the editorial and design um, aspects of the development, you really have to think then about what the formats are um, so that the ability to put the material into different learning management systems, and I would um, qualify that to say, including the same learning management system and its various new generations. As you all know, they're improved um, all the time. And so we, uh, we need to create learning objects that can uh, be used as the technology increases. For example, these types of formats tend to be able to, you're not developing something that is bound to a particular learning management system, but has uh, the ability to be used in various learning management systems. We want a structure of organizing all of this material in a consistent manner so that there can be exports of this material in different configurations that will that can then go into whatever the delivery mode is that you are using. The delivery mode um, then requires that there be rigorous testing on different platforms. Um, we you want to either have uh, an objective for actually being able to deliver uh, the courses or and, and be able to pilot them with real users before you finalize it and distribute it so that you can gather the feedback and uh, and then revise and enhance your material as needed. And uh, ideally, you're always gathering um, feedback. So into the, the technical model that we use, we do work on um, with a model in which we are looking for creating interoperable, flexible, and uniform sets of course elements. So that I've covered some at um, the, the principles behind that is that we're able to combine, we're able to modify, we're able, able to easily maintain that because it's developed. Um, we do uh, we do pay attention to SCORM. Unfortunately, the uh, the the promotion of SCORM uh, SCORM objects is uh, a little ahead of its time. We've worked with um, 
SCORM objects and looking at uh, accessibility issues and not um, and the the learning management systems really haven't gotten to a place where they truly are uh, SCORM compliant, and so we're we're building that into the future. But it doesn't uh, necessarily prove to be the case when you actually test most of it. And I'll let Danny um, talk about that a little further. So when we talk about a learning object, this is the, the working definition. It's an assembly of different types of media. And the idea is that it presents a specific concept and it's intended to achieve a defined learning object. So these different pieces of media aren't all just uh, loaded as separate pieces, but they're carefully designed to be able to for the for the learner to experience a variety of of the content in a way that creates a whole um, learning objective and provides a learning experience that can be assessed. So there's a lot to developing each of these individually and then having a way that they are um, played together. What that allows us to do is have building blocks for courses so that we can have different pieces of media that are strung together and can come and can all, when all put together might be a complete one semester of material. But they can also be broken out into um, presentations for the instructor to use in a classroom or online, might be uh, for some pieces for advanced or remedial studies, or some of it taken out so that it can go to a lower level. So again, back to the whole concept of using the principles to, deri to, to design these learning objects, it allows you to have this um, longevity and sustainability of the work uh, that, that uh, goes into. It's a lot of hard work, and you want it to last more than the, the one or two times you've taught the class. So an example in our math project is a learning object, and we create an HTML player that is the navigation. So this um, whole frame is designed to pull up the different media pieces into a complete experience in which there are different activities, presentation, some interactivity of, of being able to do problems and do a review. So we've got different concepts being presented through movie narration, animation. Um, the topics have different ways of presenting the material. There's a consistent navigation throughout. Um, text is available, both as, uh, as a closed caption and as text for additional, like an online open textbook. And then there's learning objectives and activities. So these are all bundled into um, topic uh, level objects so that uh, it's a complete experience of integrating different technologies. By taking these different objects and assignments and using them within a consistent structure in which we assemble these in different uh, folders by the different types of assignments and sometimes the different uh, formats that they come in or technologies, it creates the ability to then have that set of resources easier to organize for installation into the different, whether it's a repository or a learning management system or as HTML um, material online. And it allows for easier customization 
because there's a consistency and if all of your material, if there's multiple courses that are developed with this structure, you're able to create um, cross-disciplinary uh, uh, courses or take some of these learning objects and insert them as supplements to different um, to different uh, courses that are maybe just enhancements of the courses. It also allows you to take these learning objects and potentially use them in the myriad of social uh, networking and participatory media tools. So if you have um, discussion questions that are in folders and you know how they're organized, it's easy for you to access those and pop them into a tool like a voice thread or um, take some material that, is, that you can record a little video over that explains it to your students and post it to YouTube. Because you have it in this kind of structure, you're not um, confined to one type of delivery and one tool set, but rather you're able to share uh, through different types of social media tools. So we're getting close here uh, to, to the end of this. So just wanted to um, finish with this concept of continuously gathering feedback. Um, it's just essential in the way that education is um, changing so quickly, uh, the ways of delivery, the ways that students learn. Um, it's really important to hear from students, to involve students and other instructors in the development of your material. That feedback, um, we, have stu we have teachers now who are having students create content with a structure like this. You're able to add uh, different material as students interact with the the course, you might select some of their material and be able to um, add it to the existing body of work. And more and more students are very eager to be able to use tools. Um, so I want to emphasize in concluding that without Taking the time to attach metadata to your course or your learning objects, you really, even your own um, work after you develop it and go back to it in a year or two years, is really hard to reuse, uh, to find. And in the spirit of open education resources and being able to leverage our resources across uh, the nation, the globe, we really need to be sharing um, metadata along with the material so people know if there's, they have the right to use it, they know what it's intended to do, there's some technical formatting information and some basic searchability uh, criteria. This is a derived set from the LOM, the Learning Object Metadata Standards that are international standards. I encourage everybody to do a little bit of homework and come up with the basic set of criteria that you attach to any of the development that you're doing so that we all um, can move forward building a, a set of very high quality resources that we can all use to help educate students around the world. World, uh, and within our own um, nation. We have uh, partners in Mexico and in China and in India who have been able to access our material and, um, and be able to reuse it uh, because we're, we're developing it in this way. So um, concluding, uh, right down to the last uh, few minutes, 
Um, I, I did not pause. I see my colleague uh, Danny and, and some of you have been able to answer each other's questions in the chat. Um, we are really interested in hearing from you and for, for um, having more people participate in this work, either through joining the NROC network or working with us uh, in our connected PD project where we are connecting with people um, broadly and sharing. Uh, we have a number of activities that are coming up uh, with webinars. Uh, in June, we're going to have uh, Ryan, uh, Howard Reingold talking about his new book, NetSmart. Um, those are available to people to join our Connected PD. There's information about joining. And we have a resource library of a number of things in which this will be posted. Um, so with that, I will take a breath and see if uh, we have any particular questions that haven't been um, addressed and uh, any information anyone else wants to uh, share. And thank you all for, um, for listening to all of us. Thanks, Ruth. I, I think um, we were actually able to answer all of the questions as we were going. I don't have anything that's um, being held. Um, went really well, obviously, I'll let the Blackboard folks um, uh, kind of wrap up with their final words as, as people are departing. But just to reiterate that um, the, uh, the PowerPoint that were the PowerPoint that was used today, we've posted um, a place where you can download that. Um, and I know this recording will also be available on YouTube and, and uh, those URLs have been provided. So thanks everyone for the opportunity um, uh, to uh, listen to us and, and uh, we really appreciate um, uh, you joining us today. Thanks, Danny. And I see a hand up in the um, participant window, T. Clavin, if you can type your uh, question in the chat box, that would be great. And I do want to thank Ruth again and thank Danny, um, Ruth in particular, for your time today. And I've posted a couple of times the full NROC course development guidelines, which goes a little bit deeper into some of those areas that you skimmed uh, earlier and let us know about. So I think it was a very informative session for those of us developing courses either outside or even inside of an LMS. Um, some great steps there that I think we can glean and some further information and, and definitely some free resources um, which we all love. Um, so don't forget to visit some of those like Hippocampus as we uh, had posted earlier and we'll see if any other questions come through. But if not, we'll definitely close in a couple of minutes. I do want to remind folks that you can save the chat if you'd like. We had a couple of URLs go through there a couple of times, so use your file save and then chat and that will let you go ahead and download a text file of that so you can go grab the URLs and see the chat conversation in case it went a little fast for you. So I see a couple of notes here about posting the um, the session PDF and the uh, so I'll go ahead and post the session PDF and we are putting this up on our YouTube channel as well as NROC's uh, site here that they'll be posting the recording as well. So I'll go ahead and repost that. Ruth, there was a question about um, good uh, text um, reading material specifically about this topic. Um, is there anything that you can suggest or that we might be able to follow up with as um, an additional download available at the, uh, the URL where we're posting the um, PowerPoint? You know, I haven't uh, scanned the material that is coming out with on course development. Um, it's 
uh, of late, so I would say um, texts aren't the best source. There are some good um, resources online, and really the most interesting things I think are um, you, you. In terms of course design, there are books about uh, instructional design, but there's also current. Um, projects around connected learning and uh, networking and how to incorporate some of the new technologies into learning. Um, the book um, Connected, no, Networked Educator, I think, is a, is a really nice book that has a lot of, uh, I think, uh, Network. Oh, yep. Thanks. Networked educator. If you look for that, you'll find um, that text. Um, there's so many things going on. Connected educator. Thank you, Claudia. I had that wrong. Um, but I don't have a particular text that is a content development text. I just think things are moving along so quickly that some basic principles are out there. Um, but when we were going about doing this, there wasn't anything that really was comprehensive and systematic about uh, the whole landscape of what is going on in this field. And Ruth, if I can just add to that a little bit too, I know the guidelines that I just posted once again have a good reading list at the end that you use to put this framework together. And um, it is very contextual or situational based on kind of what you're, you know, depending on the system or, I should say, the outcomes and that you're looking for, whether it be corporate or, or educational um, or professional education related or perhaps academic in terms of what might be chosen to use. Yeah. Exactly, and really a lot of the good um, instructional design that was done just a few years ago was focused on sort of independent computer-led uh, training models um, and with participatory media and social media, the different uh, ways of recording things. The, possibilities for interactivity and a more participatory framework for uh, course design is you know ever present and changing and so uh, as you said uh, Yarlda it's really important to think about the context and your audience and their skill set and what content you're trying to present and how much is uh, just pushing content versus trying to create an experience where your um, end users are interacting with the content. And uh, again, that's why I think principles are so important. They're, they're not about uh, the particular technology. Obviously, you need that information as well. Um, but in terms of what good learning and teaching are about, those things uh, withstand the test of time. Thank you all very much for the session. I'll sign off now. Bye.